Well, thank you, and thank you for having me here. Um, this is very interesting for an economist to follow a doctor neurobiologist who's been showing you the brain because we're going from the brain to society right now and talking about the laws. But, but Dr. Hurd has already stolen my thunder in this, my pet peeve as well, the term medical marijuana. I too have benefited from significant funding from the National Institute of Health, NIDA, largely to study what is, what's the content of these laws as an economist, I work with lawyers and policy analysts, and how do they influence markets and behavior in society? And in studying this, okay, I didn't get, oh, there we go, we'll go, oh, I moved it off, sorry. I hit it and it moved off, there we go, right there. Yeah. And I just keep, yep, that's, that's, that's it. okay. Okay. That's okay. Great. I just keep touching After it. That, it should just work, yeah, just touch right there. Okay, perfect. Um, so basically, the term medical marijuana, I think, gets misused for many of the reasons that Dr. Hurd already explained. But when, when the population, the general public, hears about medical marijuana, they think, oh, medicine, and let's think about it as a medicine. And if you're going to do that in view of these laws in particular, then you need to think about how pharmaceutical drugs get out to the market as medicine. And in thinking about that, it's always a very long, lengthy, rigorous process of FDA approval during which we get information about the specific medical conditions for which the pharmaceutical has significant benefit in terms of symptomology or even curing. There's clin clinically established appropriate dosages. Even with the rats, when they're, in the, when they're in the lab, they are getting specified known doses of specific chemicals that are in that we would want to then use in a medicine. You're getting information about the standardized doses uh, that you should purchase as a consumer and then how much, how long should you be using it, what's the frequency of dosage, whether it's aspirin or opiates for appropriate medical use. Is it you use it every four hours, six hours, 12 hours? And then what are the active ingredients in what you are using and what are the preferred mechanisms for delivering those ingredients. When you look at medical marijuana laws as they exist today in the US, initial laws, and I'm purpose of my talk is really gonna be about the evolution of them. Initial laws were just talking about issues about what it might be good for, this big plant with, with literally hundreds of different compounds that some of which are very useful for medicinal purposes, some of which might not be. We don't have enough science. And then how do you get it? The clinical aspects, the dosage, the frequency, and those aspects were largely missing, and it's important to understand why. It, why I don't think it was a malicious negative concept. It was the fact that we had a federal prohibition. So what I want to talk to you about today is how these state laws evolved. The states are deciding to take action because the federal government has taken a position, and they actually have the legal right to do so. States are allowed to implement laws that influence the public health of their citizens. It's in their constitutional rights. And then draw some parallels of how this, these laws look compared to our delivery of other medications. So what I want you to take away from here is that there's really been five stages uh, or periods of medical marijuana law. And thank God today we are finally entering a, a, a period of these laws that actually I think get back to marijuana as medicine. So let me walk you through these periods. And initially they really did start back in the 1970s shortly after the federal government classified marijuana as a schedule one drug. There was a lot of debate back then whether or not this was an appropriate thing to do. There was a recognition that we had been using parts of the marijuana plants for th therapeutic purposes. And it was just custom that it had fallen out, that it had fallen out of custom. It didn't mean that the plant didn't have true medicinal value aspects of the plant. The states took it upon themselves to, to recognize that there's a need to explore the medicinal value of marijuana. And many states, 22 of them, passed medical therapeutic research programs. Of course, 
they, they passed these in law. They didn't become operational because the federal government had regulatory authority over them. Only eight of them got active. And they got active with very, very, very <coughs> narrowly accessed marijuana. It was marijuana that was grown at the University of Mississippi that could be used for medicinal purposes. Very few patients got into these therapeutic research programs. I'm not talking about whether or not this was a good policy. I'm just saying states back in the 1970s, red and blue states, Texas and California, both recognized the need to look at the therapeutic benefits of marijuana. Let's fast forward to stage two. California passing a ballot initiative in 1996, basically to make marijuana available for medicinal purposes. How and why did this happen? California, San Francisco Bay Area in particular, faced an enormous AIDS epidemic. And AIDS wasting was a serious problem. And there was experimentation with marijuana, partly through therapeutic research programs, partly off the books, where they found there was some benefit, some real medicinal benefit. This was a ballot initiative initiated by constituents who aren't real familiar with how to get a drug through the FDA process, what the needs are to do that, how to write a law that isn't in conflict with the federal government, other than don't put certain things in the law that the federal government can then crack down on, okay? This was the beginning of an era. Several states started following the same, same process, largely on the West Coast, Alaska and Maine, where they were basically making a statement that we think patients should be able to access and use marijuana. Well, use was kind of really broadly defined in terms of you can cultivate, you can process, you can, you, you can use, you can possess, you can transport. That's not, if you look at our drug laws, our criminal justice system, we have different penalties for processing methamphetamine or, or cocaine than we do for holding cocaine. So this is very, very different, right? But we're trying to get around the federal prohibition. These policies said nothing about dosage. They said nothing about what parts of the plant. They didn't say even how patients should get it beyond maybe home cultivation because they didn't know how to get around this federal prohibition. Until we get, and at this time, then there's some movement to try to help the states who are truly interested in helping patients gain access. This was a combined effort of the Marijuana Policy Project as well as Americans for Safe Access who are concerned about medicinal use to write a model policy for states to enable access to marijuana for medicinal purposes that would not get the federal scrutiny. They were specific health problems that were, had been observed in prior medical reviews, 1999 IOM review of what marijuana might be useful for with the exception of this broad category of pain. Um, they didn't require patients to register because if patients registered, they could be, a federal government could come in and take that registry and now you're under federal scrutiny. The legal protections were for the patients and the caregivers and to some extent minimal growers because that was kind of done quietly. The limitations were all about adequate supply. There was no specification of how much. So this didn't look like medicine. And there was a lot of criticism of the, these laws because they aren't laws that talk about dosage, that talk about duration, that talk about how you should use this to get better medicine. But that's also because we didn't have as much clinical science behind it, okay? Then we start the third era of, of medical marijuana laws. We're now all of a sudden, instead of doing this through ballot initiatives where voters have really good well intentions but not very good knowledge on how to enact a law and regulate it and make it so that the public health community isn't directly in violation of the law enforcement and criminal justice community and wasting resources between the two trying to meet voters' needs, we move to the legislative era with California, or I'm sorry, with Hawaii passing the first medical marijuana law through a state legislature. These laws were more specific because lawmakers actually had considerations of how do we get public health and law enforcement working together a little bit better as opposed to in violation. They have a lot more provisions requiring registry of patients, protecting them from the federal government, but still allowing, it, allowing for home cultivation. You start to see some allowances for dispensaries. California was the first to provide legal protection to dispensaries in a change through the state legislature in 2003, 
Colorado's policy in 2001 was extremely vague, allowed for dispensaries to get in there, but they didn't officially change the policy to allow for dispensaries until much, much later. It was New Mexico that passed one in 2007, and then one more state I'm blanking on at the moment. So we're starting to think about how are we gonna get this medicine to patients in a formal way. But these are dispensaries that don't look like pharmacies that offer a thousand different varieties of the marijuana plant with different mixtures of the compounds. And I can tell you that patients who would go in and get recommendations did not have a clue which plant it was that they needed for their medical condition. And you do have some dispensaries where people do know a lot about the plants and they know a lot about the medicine and they care and they're talking to the patient, well, with the, your symptoms and with your condition, you really should lean towards these plants. And then you had other dispensaries who were just going in it for the money. It's not surprising, there's a mix, it's, it's America. So, more states adopting these policies through the legislative process, some states changing their policies as well. The thing that gets me when I see studies of the effects of medical marijuana laws on recreational use or on public health harms is they assume every single law is the same. Oh, it's a medical marijuana law. I'm talking to you about the process of the law and some elements of the laws. Those elements are very different. California's medical marijuana law is extremely different than New Mexico's and New Jersey's. Colorado's a little bit more like California. So when you evaluate the study of the impact of these laws, you're mixing things just like you're mixing marijuana. You're mixing the marijuana plant, some of which are high THC, low CBD, some are high CBD, low THC, and you're mixing the policies. And so careful analysis of this is just starting to get done. And I'm very cautious to people who try to interpret findings from previous studies, including my own. So what started the fourth wave? In October 19, 2009, the Deputy Attorney General, David Ogden, said under the guidance of um, the, the, the um, actual Attorney General, we will not waste federal resources prosecuting patients who, and, and people who are engaged in providing medical marijuana laws as specified in the state law. Guess what? The states now have authority to actually go and specify how they want it implemented in their state. Now they can talk about regulating marijuana in ways that wasn't really possible beforehand because they didn't know what the federal government was going to do if they did. So that brought on what we call the fourth wave of the legislative era, where you have state policies where regulation of dispensaries is much more explicit. Who gets to have those licenses? What is the density? Where are they located? What sort of products do we want sold? Those sort of things are finally entering into the state medical marijuana policy. So if you look at a study that looks at the effects of state med medical marijuana laws and you're looking at laws from, two from 1996 to 2002, you're not talking about medical marijuana laws today. They're very, very different. And as this map shows you, I'm sorry I keep showing you all these colors, but it's, the colors are actually important. The green is a state that adopts its very first medical marijuana policy during this era. So we're in the fourth era where the late states are getting led, you know, much more rigid about how they're gonna implement these policies. And we're get, seeing you know, a little bit going on on the East Coast, a couple in the Central. The, the purple states are states that had a law already in place, but they modified it in light of the federal government's position. We have some changes going on. And then the pink ones are the ones that st stuck with their laws as they were before the federal, they got the signal from the federal government. Today, 2014, actually, in the previous slide, those are the states that reporters report that consumers generally know the, there are about 24 states plus Washington, D.C. with medical marijuana laws. That is not true. That is true of laws that talk about marijuana, the big plant, with not, not very specific. In starting in 2014, 11 states have adopted policies that are specific to cannabidiol and other compounds in marijuana, making 
that policy specific for a particular compound in marijuana that can be extracted and provided to patients for specific conditions, seizures, epilepsy. They're educated from the science that we have been doing, but they're much narrower. They're specific in dosage. The products that can be sold cannot have any more than 3% THC and must have at least 15% cannabidiol. That's a specific product. There's still a lot more we need to know. There's a lot more compounds, but this is a different policy than, hey, open up a dispensary and sell whatever products you feel are appropriate, right? Um, we have a ways to go. We, the policy is far from finished, but state medical marijuana, the recognition of marijuana as potentially having medicinal value now represents the majority of the U.S. states. The yellow states here represent states that have a CBD-only marijuana policy. And guess what? They're in the South, the ones that are anti-marijuana, anti-legalization. And they are passing policies that recognize the medicinal value of marijuana for certain conditions with certain compounds. Our policymakers are getting smarter. They're catching up to the science, but the science is still just going. But medical marijuana is something I believe, because of these policies, is going to continue to evolve. And in fact, right now, we have about two thirds of the states recognizing the medicinal value of marijuana. There could be a change to federal policy based on a state vote. What is that likely to look like? It's not gonna look like California's medical marijuana policy because that's not what the states are agreeing on. You're gonna see medical marijuana laws that are more specific to dosage limits, to labeling and testing. In fact, I'll show you shortly, recommended guidelines of model laws today are much more specific in terms of doing um. testing for the product, for mold, for bacteria for other harmful ingredients that you really don't want somebody with AIDS consuming. <laughs> that should be standard in any state policy. We wouldn't put out a medicine that hasn't been checked, and yet our state policies for a while allowed that. And product restrictions. We really don't need pot tarts out there as medicinal products, okay? Some of these products Yes, they might be okay with kids, but so is the CBD extract oil that gets at their seizure more effectively and doesn't encourage misuse of this substance. States are likely to enhance the legal protections of people to provide, to grow, to extract, to test, because until the federal government changes, they have to provide those legal protections. And so far, the federal government, with more of these, with the current administration, has been respecting those as long as it doesn't break into those eight areas where the federal government has maintained authority, no criminal involvement, um, not going to kids, there's eight specific criteria. And then I think that we're also gonna see a bigger separation between legalization of marijuana policies and medical marijuana policies because the medical marijuana policies are gonna get more and more narrow while the legalization policies are getting broader and broader. So with that, I'll end and take any questions. Thank you, Rosalie. Great uh, talk. Very exciting. Start with um, Peter over here. Okay, I'm a pharmacist, and I teach pharmacology. I, I, te I teach pharmacology on campus, and I have a problem with, like, the whole laws and everything, because I know that right now we're probably looking at it from at the food and not at the drug, even though they say medical. And you know, and in the pharmacy, they say, why are they not in the pharmacy? Because not only do you don't know the dose, and then from an economic legal standpoint, if something goes wrong with that product, who are they gonna go after? You know, we're in this country. We talk about lawyers involved, and they're gonna say, who are you gonna go after if something within that product or compound? And that's the problem that I have with that issue. And you are absolutely right, and it is a real consideration, which is why Connecticut just passed in their mar medical marijuana policy. The only people who are allowed to dispense marijuana for medicinal purposes are licensed pharmacists. 
their law says the only one who can get that license to dispense is a pharmacist who already has the obligation to think about it as a patient. So my point, again, is our laws are catching up with logic. It makes sense that a pharmacist should be the one who has the broader background of possible chemical reactions and, and, and issues. And I think that the laws are going there. I think we're starting to see that evolution. Right, and who's going to actually be producing and making those products to, like you said, maintain that's, the real That's still and going. Compound development as well. Is it going to be an OTP product and follow under the FDA and, and those, uh, like, no, we as pharmacists and scientists, we like to see data. We like to right. see Right. And then not report the consequences. So the point that's being raised is the different products that could be used and the fact that we don't have the hard science knowing what the dose in that product because the dose delivery in an edible is different than the dose delivery in a joint, is different than the dose delivery in an oil. And we need the hard data to know, given the mix of compounds in that product, what's the appropriate dose delivery, and who's going to be responsible for producing it and testing it to make sure it's safe. And I think the laws, again, are evolving. They need the federal law to change, but the states might be able to put the pressure on the federal government at this point. Hello. Uh, I'm a uh, drug, uh, alcohol, uh, alcohol drug counseling program uh, manager. Uh, and as everyone might know, the state uh, has a problem of over overcrowding in the prison, so they put them at the count, put the uh, individuals yeah. at the county level. Uh, I have lots of, um, of and they're called AB 109 uh, uh, clients. I have a lot of them with the medical marijuana card. Okay, our program, our policy is complete abstinence. When these people uh, bring their marijuana card, they are allowed to purchase it. Pro, uh, probation don't know, uh, does not know what to do with them because they're violating the probation. They're not in <laughs> compliance with our program. And if they can smoke marijuana, why can't the rest of the clients smoke marijuana? And it's really a mess. You are absolutely right. When Again, when the states were passing these laws, and you're talking about California, there wasn't much consideration of the fact that we are a state that has decriminalized possession of up to an ounce of marijuana for the average citizen, but it's still a violation of pro parole or probation to be caught in, use, uh, in possession of marijuana. And so how do you deal with that inconsistency in our, in our state laws to protect people who are on the road to recovery or if they're using marijuana while in recovery? There I think the counselors, the science, has to approach it the same way they do alcohol. Well, the probation officers are, continue, are letting them uh, smoke marijuana, and uh, a lot of them, uh, and, and the truth, we're talking about people coming out of prisons and a certain lifestyle, and it is a gateway to other uh, negative behaviors. So it's really counterproductive to, in, to the whole uh, AB 109 uh, thing because... I think we right. need, I think, as Dr. Hurd was need better knowledge of when it really is being used for medicinal purposes because you wouldn't take somebody coming out from probation who's on an opiate for chronic back pain and say, no, you can't use that. But because of the law in California, particularly being so vague, and, and a lot, it, it, it is difficult to differentiate medical use from recreational use. And that is a problem that the California law has to address. Other states are trying to avoid that entirely by going to some of these much narrower, much restrictor, and they're learning from our mistakes, basically. But we still have to fix our mistakes. I think. That's One more other questions? We're still um, still have a couple seconds here. I would just like to say that as a layperson, driving up the street or in places where there are children and youth and they have these marijuana dispensaries, seeing someone drive up, park in the red, jump out of a car, running into a marijuana dispensary with the Burger King, king hat on as a king, 
skipping out, jumping in their car, and I videotaped it and put it on Facebook. I mean, this is just <laughs> ridiculous, and it's just embarrassing. I just wanted to state that. Thank you. And I love the way you. I, I think other states are learning from our mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you.